Okay, so um, around about 2012, um, there was a lot of issues around wilding and rewilding. Um, and I thought, well, what is the history of the wild? Is there an archeology span of the wild? How would we go about discovering the wild? Um, and the wild is in some way synonymous with wood, or at least in European culture. The word derives from the old English wield or wald. Uh, and so this kind of led me into, the intro into a history of the archeology span of woodlands uh, and individual trees. Um, I'm a palynologist by training, so it was a really nice change to get out from the lab, staring at pollen, to actually wandering around the landscape, looking and interacting with trees. Um, and rather than start in the past and work forward, I thought I'd start in the present and work backwards um, to look at what contemporary archaeology uh, attitudes to uh, assemblages of non-humans were uh, and what those relations and entanglements are. So since 2012, I've been carrying out a variety of investigations, a series of nature reserves uh, and woodlands, mostly in England. So what follows is really just a sketch of what I've been doing. Um, and I'm starting with my thank yous first. So I'd like to thank my funders and supporters at the University of Worcester, the National Trust, the Foresters Forest, the Forestry Commission, uh, and the Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, and all of the students and volunteers who've helped out on this project. So just to begin with, um, I thought I'd start in Borrowdale. Borrowdale is um, a very remote place, very harsh environment, an upland environment, gets around five meters of rain a year, suffers severe hurricane force storms, um, and there's little early settlement evidence, though this photo is taken from the top of a probably early post-medieval, uh, early medieval hill fort. Um, so, some of the pollen work that's taken place in Borrowdale suggests that some of the woodlands there were not disturbed till around about 1200 AD. So there's some pollen work by Burks uh, at Johnny Wood. Elsewhere in the valley, probably other things were happening, but there's very little prehistoric record uh, in this valley. So I wanted to go and look at um, yew trees. These are the Borrowdale yews. They have an extensive literature and art record because Wordsworth wrote a poem about them. And they're four, uh, there were originally four yews, now there are three. Um, and they're around about 1500 years old. So they are an archeological monument in their own right, really. They've moved silently through the, through the past into the present. And they're also very fragile monuments. The thing about veteran trees is that are almost all hollow. And if you want to get rid of them, you just put a fire inside them and they burn down quite easily. Um, one was recently vandalized uh, in Worcestershire um, and it just burned down in the course of the night. So their survival in a sense is contingent on their entanglements with things around them, the weather, the soils uh, and human activity. So one of the things that interested me about this and the archeological potential uh, is that um, they seem to be sitting on top of an abandoned settlement. So you get um, platform settlements at the end of valleys in the Lake District. None have really been excavated to my knowledge, but they have a mixture of curvilinear and rectilinear buildings on them. So probably early post-medieval, which would fit nicely with the date of 1500 years old from dendrochronology. For the age of these things, uh, and uh, this is, as you can, Point to the, to the point work? Yeah. So you can see this is U1, sat on top of a couple of ovoid platforms, and this is U3, sat on top of a rectangular platform, and the whole thing seems to have a rough sort of enclosure of massive earth fast boulders. Um, unfortunately, U1 lost its crown in a hurricane uh, in about 20 years ago, I think, and so the National Trust left all the remains of the crown to rot down all around the monument, so it makes mapping it very, very difficult. Also, U takes a long time to rot down, so U4 blew down around about 1870, uh, and the trunk is still there, so I suspect it's gonna be in the landscape for a very long time. Uh, so that settlement was abandoned, uh, and these yew trees grew up. So I'll come on to sort of like the processes and the way we might think about that happening in terms of woodland agency uh, as um, 
Faye was talking about. Sorry about the focus picture. So this is the use from across the valley uh, in the winter. And this is a photograph from about 1850, 1860 uh, of the yew trees. And as you can see, they'd already had another storm and lost part of its crown there. Um, it lost its crown again towards the end of the 19th century. So these became monumentalized in, a, in an odd sort of way. And actually, uh, and now monumentalized formally, the National Trust has built an enclosure around them to make sure that lots of bracken and bramble grow around them uh, and have put up a, a board to commemorate them. They became part of the picturesque movement uh, in the 18th century, so people would visit them, be suitably terrified. Words with came, wrote a poem about them, um, and they have just become part of the heritage of the valley. And um, Borrowdale did have many yew trees, some of them bigger than this. Uh, unfortunately, they've all kind of died. And that is the thing about trees in the sense that if you're interested in trees, you're more than aware of the fact that the old ones are constantly dying because of poor treatment by and large. And there's the issue of how much big trees would have survived in closed canopy forests, um, uh, which is for another time perhaps. One of the engagements in which people have with this is you have these earthfast boulders. So this is not a great photograph, but that's U1 there, sort of giant elephant's foot growing out over this boulder, which was part of a structure. And people came in the 19th century. There was a great fashion for the graffiti in the late 18th, early 19th century. And graffitied, uh, here's a nice example. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but there's a WW which was always very exciting to see. I think, oh, Wordsworth came here. He actually scratched the mark. Probably not. WW is a very common graffiti sign, thought to represent Virgin Vigorum, which is a, a Catholic priest to the Virgin Mary, uh, prayer to the Virgin Mary. So difficult to know. It'd be exciting if it was, though. To make graffiti at this site, you have to want to do it. That is Borrowdale volcanic stone. You have to bring a very, very sharp knife or a hammer and chisel. And some of those marks are actually hammered in. So, you know, people really wanted to make their mark. So I'll leave you the words with poem to read while I just talk a little bit about regeneration. So um, I come at this from a sort of environmental background um, and the environmentalist Peterkin, he has this notion that sites move from um, either natural into more human influenced back to semi-natural and then to natural. And it doesn't matter where on that continuum you start, you do not have this kind of hard dichotomy between a cultural landscape and a natural landscape. Landscapes are always moving between the two. And even a cultural landscape, a lot of the organisms in that landscape are lively. They're not things farmers want there. Farmers spend billions of pounds every year trying to keep that cultural landscape cultural, uh, largely unsuccessfully. So the germ of what we might call the wild is always in every landscape. Every landscape is wanting to move away on its own trajectory, its own enabling. And the American poet Gary Snyder, and he being a poet, likens this to a Mart Artemis stepping into her bath and re-emerging pure and clean and fresh for the new day, regenerated. And I think that's a good way to think about these things. We get very hung up on nature, but I think wildness, the concept of the wild and wild processes leading us backwards and forwards between more domestic and more wild is, is quite a good way of avoiding that uh, nature culture discussion. So these trees, they came in, they had their own agency, they took over this place, they survived uh, and they continue to the present day. So the next sort of thing I want to talk about a little bit is some work I did at the Speech House Forest of Dean. So this has been a partially wooded area um, for about a thousand years, give or take. Um, it's a royal forest, uh, and so lots of memorials to various royalty from over the years. Um, it's the largest area of deciduous woodland in England, around about 10 and a half thousand hectares but that's quite tiny uh, in many different ways. It's divided into enclosures, which are enclosed areas of woodland uh, and wastes. And you have veteran trees in this. 
they mainly survive uh, in the waste or on the unenclosed areas. So these are some examples of veteran trees. This is a big old sweet chestnut down at Bigsweir, and this is shade and tuft oak. Veteran trees don't really survive in the Forest of Dean. It's a working forest. It's there to provide wood for coal mines, for steelworking, various other things. So when you do have a veteran tree, the Forestry Commission tends to give it a little nameplate. So this is the shade and tuft oak. Um, and these things have charisma. The geographer Lorimer, he talks a lot about charisma uh, and how charisma draws human beings into particular things uh, and ignores other things. But we also have things that aren't terribly charismatic. These are veteran hollies. They're also veteran trees. Hollies are fascinating. And one of the things at Speech House is it has the survival of a holly wood, which is very unusual. Hollies are fantastic for food in the winter. They provide great winter fodder. They also regenerate themselves, so they're very good at cloning themselves, and they're also very good at living in remnants of their dead forebears. So this on the right here is a holly with a new holly growing out of it, and fortunately it fell apart, so you could see the roots inside it. So these have their own agency and a will to survive that uh, is quite impressive. So alongside charisma, we also have animus. And humans are quite antagonistic to the natural world. Very few places quite as antagonistic as the UK, but we are very antagonistic. Um, and so two examples of this, the hollies are a third. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, they decided that they didn't want any understory in the Forest of Dean. So they removed all the understory trees from throughout all the plantations. Uh, it was a big debate, but they did it. And so you don't find understory trees anymore in the Forest of Dean, particularly. One of the other animuses is uh, they didn't like deer uh, in the middle of the 19th century, despite the whole reason for the forest being to hunt deer. In the 19th century, they decided that deer were um, a temptation for the commoners who might poach them and thereby um, endanger their immortal souls. So they killed all the deer. They just went out and they just shot every single last one and they hung the heads of them in the verderer's court in the speech house. It's a remarkable thing to do. Of course, the deer didn't particularly care. Being lively beings, they ran away and then they came back again. So plenty of deer these days in the forest. I think. The other animus is uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, oak trees were no longer um, desired, so they underplanted them with um, conifers, uh, and so I think these are Douglas firs, and so the Douglas firs, the idea is they grow up over the top of the oaks, and the oaks die. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see with this one, they have produced these beautiful goblet-shaped forms as they kind of reach up towards the light. Um, and this is quite fortuitous, because of course now hardwoods are all popular again, so they can just cut down the forest the coniferous forest, and they have all these 150-year oaks which have been kind of stuck. They'll make interesting dendrochronological specimens. Uh, can just regrow and bloom again. So just to, just to prove that I did actually do some work, this is, this is a map of all the different trees, uh, uh, mainly oak, mainly holly, um, and the, 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 it's an island, like so many nature reserves are. Um, it's an island, it's a triple SI, all around, all the veteran trees, all of the uh, understory has been removed. So it makes a great resource for bats and funguses and lichens and everything else. And finally, when I started doing this in 2012, I blundered around quite a lot because you don't really meet many archeologists who have any interest in trees in the present landscape whatsoever. Um, but eventually I started going to these Econet conferences um, and this is the conference proceedings from a 2019 conference. Uh, investigating tree archaeology. So thank you very much.